So what have we done? Um, we started looking at things more abstractly. So we looked at rings. We looked at a ring. So this is a set where you have addition, subtraction, you have a zero, you have multiplication, um, and the usual rules of, so, and we have a one, um, our rings will have unity. So addition is commutative. There's a, a additive uh, identity. There's an additive inverse. There's multiplication. Multiplication is commutative. It distributes and so on. So just all the usual rules of uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, um, no division, no division, not necessarily division. And in fact, the places where you do have division, so the set, the set R cross is exactly the set of units, set of units. And what are units? Elements of R for which Yes, it has an inverse. There exists a V in R with U times V equals 1. Okay? Um, that's a unit. Then we talked about uh, irreducibles. So R in R. So this is another definition. I guess this is a definition. The units. R in R is irreducible. If, what does it mean to be irreducible? There are two definitions that are kind of competing, and I'm going to try to write R for irreducibles and P for primes to really drive home the distinction. For general rings, there is a distinction. Factors as units and associates. Yes, if you if S divides R, then either S is associate to R or S is a unit. I guess I forgot to say what associates are. Let's say what associates are. R is associate associates so R and S are associates if and only if there is a unit such that R is equal to S times that unit okay and that's an equivalence relation and what does it mean to be prime You guys remember? Um, the of the, um, must include a unit. Um, I'm, I'm trying to parse what you said. A factorization of P must include a unit sounds like uh, irreducible. It's the other way around. So irreducible is about who divides me. And prime is about who do I divide. That's another way of thinking about it. For an associate, can S itself be a unit? I guess all units are associate to one another. But no, if R is not a unit, then S can't itself be a unit unless R is itself a unit. Did that make sense, Sarah? Did my answer make sense? So yes, all units are associate to each other, but in general, S can't be a unit if R isn't. Sarah, did I answer your question? Okay. All right. Well, ask again if uh, if you um, if you can if you, ask again if if you're still not happy. Um, but Sheik is exactly right. If you have your prime, if you divide a product, then you either divide a or b. Or both, as usual, or both. Okay, so irreducible, yeah, maybe that's a good thing to, to write down. Irreducible is who divides me. Whereas prime asks, who do I divide?
Okay? Does that make sense? So far, so good. Now, I had said that um, in a general, well, so let me let me let me uh, prove something. So here's a little lemma. The easy one is prime implies irreducible. We sort of I realized as I went through the notes that we never uh, came back to this. So prime implies irreducible. Let's see why that's true. And let's see the extra little condition that I've implicitly been keeping around but never uh, uh, brought to the forefront. So let's do that now. Um, so prime. So R in P, P and R is prime, and I, and I want to claim that it's irreducible, okay? So I'm given a prime, let P and R be prime. So far, so good. And I want to check irreducibility, which means I want to see what happens if somebody divides P. Uh, suppose I have an element, let's say S, dividing P. And what I want, what I want, is that either S is a unit or S is associate to P. Okay? That's what I want to prove. That will prove that P is, since this is true for any S, that means that P is irreducible, which is what I'm trying to prove. So suppose S divides P. What does it mean to divide? That means there exists some R such that um, S times R is equal to P. Maybe let me let me call it K so as not to confuse R's and, and P's and so on. What does it mean to divide? It means that there's somebody that you divide. I mean, S times K is P. All right? But primes are about who do you divide. So notice that that means P divides S times K. So P divides S times K um, either means either means one of two things. Either P divides S or P divides K. Does that make sense? Okay. If P divides S and S divides P, so this implies that uh, P and S are associate, right? Um, if P divides S, that means that P times L is S, and S and P is S times K, and um, L is, uh, and S is P times L, so I'm going to put P times L into S, so this is P times L times K, so far so good. Is everybody following? I'm just, I'm just kind of following all the rules that we have available to us. Um, so if we have a divisor of P, what I want to show is that either that divisor is a unit or that divisor is associate to P. So, so being, a div being that S divides P means that there's some number so that S times that number is P. And this thing is in the ring, of course. But if P is equal to S times K, then P divides S times K. And now we use the fact that P is prime. So because P is prime, it divides a product, implies either it divides the S term or it divides the K term. If it divides the S term, let's look at, let's look at what that means. That means that, that it times somebody is equal to S. Let's call that somebody L. So let's stick in. We had this equation P equals KS. I'm just rewriting it here. Now I'm sticking in in place of S, PL. So PL has replaced S. And now I have this funny equation. P is equal to P times L times K. So what this implies, can you guys still see? What this implies, let's subtract to one side. I'll subtract, let's say, to, uh, to that side. So P times LK minus P is equal to 0. and I factor it out of P. Okay? Does everybody see that? Now, here's the one word that we kind of have been skirting. It's the, it's the term integral domain. So a ring, let me throw in a definition, which is crucial here. Uh, definition, a ring 
R is an integral domain if this is the very basic property the only way two numbers multiply to zero is if one of them at least one of them is zero or both okay so it means there are no zero divisors there's no there's no non-trivial zero divisors if two numbers if x divides zero it's because either it's because x is uh, itself zero well that's not quite um, if two numbers multiply to zero then then one of them is zero okay p is not zero so this is in integral domains which I've kind of implicitly but not explicitly been using all along uh, assume for R an integral domain. Okay? So now what we have, now P is not zero, because primes are not zero, and that implies, let's finish the argument here, so this implies, this implies that L times k minus 1 is equal to 0. But if L times k minus 1 is equal to 0, then L times k is 1. Chang, you're, you want to say something? So will it not be true if it's not an integral domain? Um, yes, it will not be true if... Uh, if so let's, let's just see an example of a non-integral domain. Example, or maybe non-example. Non-example. How could this not, not be the case? Well, what about the ring Z mod, I don't know, Z mod 6? For example, z mod 6z. That's a perfectly fine ring. You can add and subtract and multiply. You can't divide. Addition is commutative, multiplication is commutative, and everything distributes nicely because it does so in z. So this is just z mod 6. But what is 2 times 3? Okay, 2 times 3 is 0. Yep and neither 2 nor 3 are 0. So this is a non, this is not an integral domain. Okay, so um, there you can have numbers that are prime but not irreducible, and you can have, as we saw already more generally, you can have irreducibles that are not prime if, uh, if you're not a unique factorization domain. Okay, let's just finish the argument. So again, we're trying to prove that if you have a prime, that's uh, in your ring, then it is irreducible at least as long as the ring is an integral domain. So um, suppose you have a divisor, you want to show that that divisor, to show that P is irreducible, that divisor either has to be a unit or it has to be associated to P itself. So what does it mean to be a divisor? It means there's a, some number K, so that S times K is P, so P divides S times K. We have two options, P divides S or P divides K. Let's look at the first option, P divides S. That means there's a P, P times L is S. So far, so good. Am I going too fast? Karen, you have your hand up? Or is that... Oh, okay. That's a leftover. Your, your hand is... Your virtual hand is up, although your actual hand is giving me a thumbs up. Okay. You don't... Oh, there we go. Okay, good. Just, just checking. Just checking. Um, so we have a P times L, which is S. And I'll replace here S with P times L. So P is equal to P times L times K. I'll factor out P. P times LK minus 1 is 0. P is not 0. That means LK minus 1 is 0. That means L times K is 1. And what does that mean? That means K is a... Yep, so k is a unit, and if k is a unit, let's go all the way back, if k is a unit, then p and s are Come on, if k is a unit, if two numbers differ by a unit, then they're, then they're associates. Then s is associate to p. So that's that's that case. 
And now if, so, so that finishes the computation if P does divide S. If P divides K, guess what? You run exactly the same argument. So same argument, same argument, which will give us that S is the thing that's the unit and not K. It tells us that S is a unit. Okay, so S is either a unit or S is associate to P, which implies P is irreducible. And completes the proof of this simple lemma. Okay, any questions? Thumbs up if that made sense? Okay, so far so good. Um, all right, so how about the other way? The other way, it's not even enough to be an integral domain. The, in the other direction, it's not even enough to be an integral domain. So converse, lemma. Now we really need that R is a PID. R is a PID. So assume R is a PID. Then um, irreducible implies prime. Okay, does that make sense? So proof. Uh, let R be irreducible. Let R and R be irreducible. I want to show that it's prime. Will this lecture also be posted? Yes, of course. Every lecture is posted. Oh, um, right. The review lectures, I, I prefer to do a review lecture on a big blackboard. And the big blackboard, I can't record. So that's why that the other review lecture wasn't posted. I couldn't record it. But now we're forced to do things on, online, and so there's no, yes, this will be posted. Okay, Sarah? All right. Um, good. So uh, let R be irreducible. I want to show that R is prime. So how am I going to get to R being prime? Well, how do I check that something's prime? I need to see, suppose it divides a product of two things, then it has to divide one or the other. Okay, so let's assume that R divides A times B. So I want to know that R divides either A or B. And let's assume, so that we don't have to run two arguments, that R does not divide A. So what we need, we need to show, is that R divides B. If R divides uh, A times B, R has to divide one of them. So if it doesn't divide A, it has to divide B. Okay? All right. Now, we have to use the fact that R is a principal ideal domain, and we're going to do that right now. Um, so look at the ideal. Look at the ideal generated by R and A. That's an ideal, and R is a principal ideal domain. So this is generated by some single element, D, where we know that D is the GCD. This is using the fact that R is a PID. Okay, um, But what is D? But D divides R, and R is irreducible. So that means one of two things, either um, D is associate to R or D is a unit. Okay? Now let's look at this case. If D is associate to R, so D is equal to R times a unit, but D also divides A. D divides R and D divides A because D is, is in the um, ideal generated by both of these, right? Or rather, the ideal, so A is contained in the ideal, uh, A is contained in the ideal generated by D. So let's say A, the element A is contained in the ideal generated by D because it's in here and this is 
everything. Does that make sense? So D divides A. The problem is we said R doesn't divide A. And if R times U divides A and U is a unit, then R divides A. Does that make sense? So the point is this case can't happen. So this can't happen. Because we assumed R doesn't divide A. So it's the D divides A, and D is R times U. Okay, so the point is, um, all I'm saying is, you have this element R, you look at the ideal generated by R and A, that's gonna be a principle, we're in a principle ideal domain, so it's just a single, um, it's generated by a single element. So R is, uh, the element R is in here, that means D divides R. Right? This is the set of all multiples of D, and R is there. That means R is some multiple of D. So D divides R. So what multiple of D is R? Well, because R is irreducible, either D is associate to R or a unit. And it can't be associate to R because if it's associate to R, it also divides A, and that means R divides A. And we assumed R doesn't divide A. Okay? Run that argument a couple of times in your head if, if need be. But uh, the point is, what we're really proving is that if R is irreducible and R doesn't divide A, then the ideal generated by R and A is right, it's all of R, exactly, exactly. Because once D is a unit, so if D is a unit, then the ideal generated by D is all of R. What are the multiples of a unit? Well, anything is a multiple of a unit. Okay? So what we've shown, so uh, what we have in summary, what, we, what we've shown just now is that R does not divide A and R irreducible implies that the ideal generated by both R and A is everything. That's what we have so far. Well, now let's multiply everything, every element here by B. So what that means is R times B and A times B generates the ideal generated by B. I'm just multiplying every possible element by B. So the ideal generated by RB and together with the ideal generated by A times B generates the ideal generated by B. Does that make sense? This is very similar if you look back at our at the way we proved unique factorization in the integers themselves. It was basically identical to this. Okay. Now, um, R, so what I want to know is that R divides B. R divides B uh, in the language of ideals is that the ideal generated by R contains the ideal generated by B. Right? Anything that's a multiple of R is automatically a multiple of B because R is a divisor of B. Um, now notice, but the ideal generated by R times B is definitely in, um, is definitely contained in the ideal generated by R. Anything that's a multiple of RB is automatically a multiple of R. How about the ideal generated by AB? AB is just R. AB um, is a multiple of R. So anything that's a multiple of AB is already a multiple of R. So the ideal generated by both of them is also contained in uh, the ideal generated by R. And that means B is contained in the ideal generated by R, which means 
r divides b. Any questions on on this converse lemma? I'm just uh, cleaning up a little bit the the leftovers from uh, bits and pieces of lecture. Does that make sense? So again, if you don't like this abstract stuff, there's not, uh, well, you should get to like it. It should grow on you like a, like a moss or something. I don't know. You'll get used to it. You'll get used to it. Is, is, anybody, uh, is anybody happy? Can I get a thumbs up if you're happy with this proof? Can I get a thumbs down if, if something's confusing? Thumbs up. Okay, great. Great, great. All right. So that was um, rings. Uh, I guess I, I meant to remind you about ideals, but you, you know about ideals. Um, irreducibles, associates, primes, units, uh, principal ideal domain. So what we proved, so recall what we proved, I won't redo the proofs, uh, but what we proved about these things is that a Euclidean domain, Euclidean domain, which by the way, um, right, so th this just means has a division algorithm. Um, is a principal ideal domain. I won't review the proofs. A principal ideal domain is an Ethereum. We'll, I'll remind you in a second what an Ethereum, I mean, no there, no there. And then IAN, I think you guys told me. Although Euclid, Euclid is EAN, I mean, no there is IAN. I don't know what the rule is for when it's when you add an IAN versus an EAN. Anyway, an Ethereum ring. And once it's an Ethereum, there's an ORD function. ORD sub P uh, makes sense and has good behavior, has good properties. In other words, it, it acts like it should. It acts like a logarithm. It adds under multiplication. And that means you have a unique factorization domain. Okay, we did all this fancy stuff. Um, let me remind you what an Ethereum is. Definition, R is an Ethereum. If, if and only if, I mean it's a definition. What does an Ethereum mean? Do we remember? Perfect. Nested integrals become the same after a certain point. Uh, so there exists an N. Okay. If you have nested integral, nested uh, ideals, nested ideals. So this is the ascending chain condition. This is called the ascending chain of ideals, chain of ideals condition. So any ascending chain of ideals eventually stabilizes. Great. Um, or it has good properties. The examples that we worked through, examples of Euclidean uh, domains. So Z, Z adjoin I, which we used to write primes as sums of two squares. Um, any uh, field adjoin X, polynomial rings, polynomial rings. And then the one we really were interested in was the Eisenstein integers. And in here, let's review how we found representations of primes as, uh, this is of course, if P is one mod three. Okay, so, um, so all I'm gonna do is review how we did this. I think the other examples uh, are pretty basic. Um, why, is, why is K adjoined X a Euclidean domain? The units are the uh, the elements of the field. That's true. The degree is the norm, and 
That's right, so the norm here, let's just review this for a second. Here, the norm is the degree. The zero polynomial has no degree. You can call it minus infinity or something. So the norm function doesn't, uh, doesn't want to, let's, we're not going to define the norm function on the zero element of the ring. But what makes it Euclidean? I need a division algorithm. Yep, polynomial long division. And the division algorithm is polynomial, polynomial, uh, long division. Okay, so you'll have some practice. You might have some practice uh, on the midterm of this. So let's just make sure we know how to do polynomial long division. Any questions on polynomial long division? You guys remember how to do this? We did a couple of examples. There are some examples in the homework. You can look at the homework. You can look at the homework solutions. That is all, all good. Okay. Any other questions before I review how to do this? That this is basically all we covered. We just went kind of. I mean, we lost a lecture, and there there isn't, uh, and we had spring break. Even though it's been a little while since the the previous midterm, we haven't covered all that much material. Sarah wants to say something. Maybe a side question, can we go over Gaussian integers? Sure, um, yeah. Uh, let me review this first, just to make sure I don't run out of time, and then I'll review this. I'll review this in light of our uh, kind of attack on, on this problem. Sound good, Sarah? Okay, and Ming Chao, were you going to write something? No. Okay. All right, so let's review. Let's review. Okay, so um, review how to find um, x and y integers such that p is congruent to 1 mod 3 implies, well, given a prime that's 1 mod 3, I want to find x and y so that p is x squared minus xy plus y squared. Okay? So what do you do? Should we do, a, you, you guys want to do an explicit example or you want to do a uh, theoretical example? Can I... You want to write in theoretical or explicit? And we'll take a poll. Okay, explicit. I have one vote for explicit and zero votes for theoretical. You know, maybe voting should be rolling so that once you see a result and if you're happy with the result, you don't bother. And then if you're unhappy with the result, you, you start voting in the opposite direction, hoping to. Okay, fine, two to zero for explicit. Really, nobody else has an opinion or you're all happy with explicit. E, fine, explicit. All right, let's do an explicit example. So somebody give me a prime. Example. Uh, give me a big prime. Do I need to go get one myself? Both. Great. Thank you, Karen. So we'll do, um, we'll do explicit and abstract. Abstractly. So explicit example. Uh, does someone want to give me one or I have to... Let's go... What's the, I don't know. Can we try to do a big example? I don't know how bad this will be. So here's the 500th prime. Seven. Seven's too simple because we don't really see the power of the method. Um, three, five, seven, one. That's eight, nine, seven. Yeah, that's good. Let's, uh, we, we did, did we do 149 last time? So I, let's do a big one. Let's do, let's do three, five, seven, one. I think this will be a good exercise. Okay. Um, you guys know this thing about the, uh, the digits adding up. You add up the digits, so what is P mod 3? Will be 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 1. 
3 plus an 8, 9, 9, and uh, 7. Well, 7 is one more, so this is 1 mod 3. You guys know this? You know why this works? It's because 10 is 1 mod 3. So this is 3 times 10 cubed. This is because 10 is 1 mod 3. So that trick you learned in, in grade school where you add up the digits to, to see what the, if the sum of the digits adds up to a multiple of 3, then the number itself adds up to a multiple of 3. The reason that works is the sum of the digits is the modulus. So if the modulus is 0, is the remainder. And that's because 10 is uh, 1 mod 3. So it works also mod 9 because 10 is 1 mod 9. The two numbers that 10 is 1 mod. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so it's because of modular arithmetic that this stuff works. So the point is 10 cubed. This is 3 times 10 cubed, but 10 is 1. So forget about the 10. This is 5 times 10 squared. This is 7 times 10, and that's a 1. Um, all right. So we know without doing any hard work that this is uh, 1 mod 3. Um, and therefore, we can find these numbers. All right. Abstractly, we were given a P. Um, let's give a name. Let L be P minus 1 over 3. Will it also work for 21? Um, the problem is uh, uh, 21 meaning, can you also check if a number is a multiple of 21 by adding the digits? Is that what you mean, Sarah? So 21 is, a number is a multiple of 21 if and only if it's a multiple of uh, 3 and, uh, and 7 separately. So we can check multi divisibility by 3 immediately. Is there a trick for divisibility by 7? I, I think there is, but I don't remember what it is, and it's kind of complicated, and it doesn't work for all numbers. Um, it's not that 21 is 1 mod 10. It's that 10 is 1 mod 3. Oh, no. Uh, again, 19... Yeah, it, it goes the other way, Sarah. Uh, and, and Karen, it goes the other way. So it's, it's only for... Uh, Numbers that are 1 mod 10, but the only numbers that are 1 mod 10 are 3 and, and 9. Because 1 less than 10 is 9, and the only divisor of 9 is 3. So that's why that's a trick. Ming Chao, I'm sorry you're having a problem. It seems to me everybody else is, is okay, so I think it's a local problem, right? No one else is getting uh, logged out, getting kicked out, and kicked back in? Stephanie, are you also getting kicked out, or...? No, okay. Uh, sorry, Ming Chao. You can you can watch the video after. Um, all right. So why am I taking L to be p minus one over three? So what is L in our case? So p minus one is three five seven o uh, divided by three. Three is a thousand fifty seven. Well, fifty there's a thirty, so that's a hundred, and then twenty seven is a nine ninety. Is that right? Did anybody check that arithmetic? Is that p minus one over three? The reason is, then, um, well, a to the l cubed is a to the p minus 1, because 3 times l is p minus 1, and that's 1. So any number of the form a to the l, so any z that's equal to a to the l has z cubed, uh, congruent to 1 mod p and will behave like a cube root of unity right um, now but we don't want 1 itself we don't but we don't want the solution z equals 1 so what can we do so look at polynomial look at so my claim is that lots and lots of, uh, in fact, 2L of the uh, numbers, my claim is that 2L uh, of the A's mod P have um, A to the L not equal to 1. 
And notice that L is like P over 3. So that's two-thirds of the number of the numbers. Okay? Does that make sense? Why is that? Well, why? So look at look at the polynomial. What does this mean? If A is a look at the polynomial, x to the L minus 1 equals 0. How many solutions does this have mod P? My claim. So these are the bad guys. These are the guys I don't want. If I raise a number to the lth power and I get 1, um, that's useless for me. I want to raise things to the lth power and get something that isn't 1, so that when I cube it, I do get 1. So I, I claim that any polynomial, as long as it has a non-constant coefficient, uh, any polynomial, any polynomial of degree L has, at most, L roots. Why is that? Well, you can do this, so the proof is, let me, let me not go into a technical proof, but it's by induction, by induction on L. So if you have a polynomial of degree L, and it's not like the zero polynomial. So um, if you have a polynomial of degree L, if f of if f of x is a polynomial of degree L, um, well, how about degree one? So what does it mean to be a polynomial of degree one? That means a x plus b is f of x. And how many roots does that have? Well, a is not zero because I assumed f isn't. Uh, well, if a is zero and b isn't zero, then this has zero roots. And if a is zero and b is zero, then it has p roots. Then it has too many roots. So I don't want the zero polynomial. So this implies x is negative b times a inverse, whatever a inverse is in that prime. So this is the case L equals 1. And then the induction step is if you have a root, so the induction step, ah, can you see this? I have to go into here. Induction. The induction step is if f of x has a root, let's say r, then f of x is equal to x minus r times g of x, and g of x has lower degree. Degree l minus 1. Okay? Does that kind of make sense? Maybe um, let, me, let me say the reason for that. If we do polynomial long division, it's again, polyno it's again the division algorithm. Uh, the proof of this, this is sometimes called the factor theorem. It's called the factor theorem. That if you have a root, then that root factors out and you're left with another polynomial. So the, the proof, the proof is just a division algorithm. Which means if I take f and I divide it by um, x minus r, I'll get some quotient polynomial. Uh-oh, some remainder polynomial, but I used R for a root and remainder. Uh, give me another letter, please. Q. Uh, anybody? Another letter instead of R. I'm even so used to R as the remainder. S. Great. S. Okay. Now, S is a polynomial of degree smaller than the degree here. The degree here is... The degree of x minus r is 1, so the degree of s is strictly less than 1. But look at what happens when we stick in, now evaluate both sides at r equals 0, at x equals r. Evaluate at x equals r. What happens on this side? r was assumed to be a root of f. That means when you set r, so f of r is, f of r on one hand is what does it mean to be a root? 
if that f of r is I either lost all of you or you all know the answer and don't want to write it. Thank you, Devendra. Right? What, what does it mean to be a root? It's that at that value, r, the answer is the, the polynomial evaluates to zero. How about here? r minus x minus r when x is equal to r is also zero. And so zero times q is zero and what I'm left with is s. So there's no remainder. So if you do polynomial division, the remainder is zero, and Q is exactly this polynomial G that I wanted. Okay, so all I'm saying is um, a polynomial of degree L has at most L roots, so there can't be more than, so what this means, what this means, this implies the number of A mod P with a to the L minus one equal to zero is at most L. In other words, lots of the, lots and lots, two L of the values, the remaining values have A to the L not equal to one. Does that make sense? So what does that mean on the um, explicit uh, side? So we try A's, try A's until a to the L does not equal one. So how about A equals two? So I wanna take two and raise it to this power. Now, okay, this is what I said uh, on your midterm. I wanna know that you remember how to do this uh, efficiently. So maybe 1190, you have to write out in base two. I won't give you numbers this, this big, but you do this efficiently. but I'm gonna cheat in the interest of time and not do it efficiently. I'm just gonna tell Mathematica to do it. Will you forgive me? You don't wanna sit here and watch me do it, repeated squaring. Or do you? You don't, good. If, if you ask me to, I, I, I can, we can talk about it, but let's not. Um, so I'm, I'm taking uh, L, L in our case is 1190, so two to the 1190 mod 3571, okay, so um, I don't know, Mathematica sounds extra efficient to me. It is, but I've, I've set the rules that I don't, I mean, all of these problems on the exam, you can just plug into Mathematica and it'll tell you the answer. So that's, that's not the point, right? So that's why I'm making the rules kind of, any calculator thing, raising two to some power, you, you do not want to, in a calculator, raise two to the 1190th power and try to reduce that mod 3571. You have to do this efficiently. Mathematica knows how to do it, but I want to make sure you know how to do it. And the answer you get is 3476. 3467, I'm dyslexic. Calculators can't handle it, exactly, exactly. But Mathematica can. So, so don't just write this as your, as your answer. Show me how you did it, okay? It won't be that hard. Uh, right, so did we get one? We didn't get one, right? 30, 34, uh, 67 is not one. This is not one. So we already won right away. We had a 66% chance. We got lucky on our first coin toss. If, eight, if two didn't work, then try three, try five, try six, seven. Very quickly, you will find uh, a number that does work, okay? because two thirds of the numbers will work. Fine, once you have such a number, now, once you have such a number, uh, what do you do? So you said Z, so this number will be Z. Z is equal to third, three, four, six, seven. And now what we're gonna do is take the GCD. If you recall what this means, let's, let's keep working the theoretical side. So let's continue the discussion here. Uh, okay, so on the theoretical side, this is the theoretical side, abstract side. Abstractly, what we know is that z cubed minus one is zero mod p. Precisely because z is a number of the form a to the l. Okay, sure. you want me to check that? So three, four, six, seven cubed will be one mod 
3571. And what that means is that z cubed minus 1 is equal to p times some integer. But this is equal to z minus 1 times z squared plus z plus 1. And z minus 1 doesn't divide p. This z minus 1 and p are co-prime, which means, um, which means it's, it's this term, z squared plus z plus 1, which is p times some other number. This wasn't the divisor. The z minus 1, this is still in the integers. Now, now you go to the Eisenstein integers. Now you switch to the Eisenstein integers, where this factors further as z minus w times z plus, uh, plus w is wrong. It's minus w bar. And so p factors, which implies p factors. So we need the GCD in the Eisenstein integers of z minus omega and p, and that will give us some a plus b omega, uh, x plus y omega, which is the thing that will that will win. x squared, the norm of x plus y omega, which is x squared minus x y plus y squared. Yeah. Okay. So that was all on the abstract side. On the, th on the um, concrete side, explicit side, concrete, concrete side, we have this number z. So I look at z minus omega. Z minus omega is 3, 4, 6, 7 minus omega. And I need to compute the GCD of 3, 4, 6, 7 minus omega with 3, 5, 7, 1. Now, th th this is the thing that's going to be a little annoying. Because now we need to start running the division algorithm. So 3, 5, 7, 1 is equal to, let's see if we can do this without wasting too much time. 3, 4, 6, 7 minus omega times q plus r. This is q1, r1. So if I take this quotient, 3, 5, 7, 1 divided by 3, 4, 6, 7 minus omega. I multiply on top by 3, 4, 6, 7 minus omega bar. Omega bar is omega squared, so this is the stuff to keep around everywhere. Omega bar is exactly omega squared, which is negative 1 minus omega. So I'm subtracting omega bar. I'm multiplying top and bottom by 3, 4, 6, 7 minus omega bar. But omega bar is negative 1 minus omega. So this is negative 1 minus omega. So far so good? Is equal to, gosh, 3, 5, 7, 1 times 3, 4, 6, 8 minus omega over. Now this I know is going to be, um, well, it's going to be z squared plus z plus 1. 3, 4, 6, 7 squared plus 3, 4, 6, 7 plus 1. So now I need a calculator. 3, 4, 6, 7 times 3, 4, 6, 7 plus 3, 4, 6, 7 plus 1 is this number. 12 million. Jesus. Uh, the denominator is, let me just write it here. This is 12 million 23,557. But that divided by, so I, so let's look at what this product is. Oh, this is nasty. Um, actually, it's not that bad because this is also going to be around the same size. I think Q is going to be one. I think Q is going to be one to start. Yeah, you can already see it here. So I have a a one. I have a negative omega over some huge number, twelve million. And then um, so that's the the W part, the imaginary part. On the top row, did I subtract? Yes, I subtracted. I subtracted exactly. I sub I multiplied top and bottom by minus w bar. But here I wrote minus w bar as negative one minus w. Ah, should I get a plus there? Sarah, are you catching this mistake? 
Thanks for catching that mistake, Sarah. Did everybody else catch it? Yeah, thank you. I'm sure it confused others, because it was wrong. So it's good to be confused when something's wrong. Um, right. This number, 3571, I mean, I'll tell you what it is. 3571 times 3468 is another 12 million and change. Okay? So this is very close to one. That's our first Q. I think, well, it depends on how small, how big or small this number is. But all right, so our first Q is one, which means our first R, R1, is equal to um, 3571 minus 3571 minus uh, 346, 3467. It's 104. 104. So if Q is one, then I need to add another 104 and a minus omega, a uh, plus omega. Does that make sense? Are you guys doing this with me? So far so good. Next, I need to write three, four, six, seven minus omega as Q2 times 104 plus omega plus R2. I hope this won't be too bad. Hopefully we're, you see the numbers are dropping, so they need to drop pretty fast. Let's see how bad this is. Okay, so I look at the ratio of this divided by this, three, four, six, seven minus omega divided by 104 plus omega. I multiply top and bottom by 104 plus omega bar and 104 plus omega bar. On the bottom, it's okay to multiply by omega bar because I know that this is gonna be 104 squared minus 104 times one plus one squared. Just because that's what the norm always is. The norm of x plus wy is x squared minus xy plus y squared. So this is x squared minus x times y, where x and y are, x is 104 and y is one. So that's the denominator. In the numerator, I don't want to write w bar. I want to write negative one minus w. So this is negative one minus w. Okay? Did, am I getting this right this time? Negative one minus uh, 104 is 103. So this is 103. And now I need 103 times six, 103 times Three, four, six, seven is, gosh, this is not going to be so pretty. Three, five, seven, one, oh, one. Your numbers will not be this big. Don't worry. So that was the product of these two. Then I have a minus W. So let's write it minus three, four, six, seven W. So I'm just foiling. Minus a 103 W. Um, minus a 103 W. So far, so good. You can still see this. And then uh, minus W times minus W, that's a plus W squared. And a W squared, so this is plus W squared, but I'm gonna replace W squared by negative one minus W. Okay, let's put everything together. Um, so I have this number, this number minus one is Three five seven one hundred. Um, how many W's do I have? Uh, another one, another three makes that a seventy, and another one makes that a seventy-one. Three five seven one W. Uh oh, I'm seeing something happening. And what is the denominator? What is one hundred and four squared minus one hundred and four plus one? Hmm. I, what I was seeing was the 3571 getting pulled out, but what's left is uh, 10713. Okay, well, that is whatever it is. Ah, but now, what is, is everybody getting this? I guess you're trusting me on the, on the, the, the numerical calculations, which you, could, you can check on your own as well. So what is this close to? So 3571, 00 divided by 
10713 is 100 thirds. So this is close to 33. And what is this close to? Um, it's the same thing except it's close to zero. Plus zero W. Who's with me? Who's, who's with me in this calculation? Give me a thumbs up if you're with me and a thumbs down if you're confused about anything. Karen, so so. Do you want to unmute yourself and tell me where, where you're happy and where you're unhappy? You're trusting me on the numbers, but could you do this computation? All right, well, that's, um, you know, we're, we're recording this, so you'll get a chance to listen back to it again as you're doing it yourself. Sarah? Maybe with smaller numbers. Yeah, well, maybe it was my fault for uh, shooting for, for hitting for the stands. Um, I think we're almost done. I think we're almost done. I'm seeing good stuff happening here. So if this is Q, if Q is 33, I hope I haven't made a mistake. Other, if you make a mistake at any point here, you're dead. You're absolutely dead. Uh, we're going to see R2 should be much smaller than 104 plus omega, and that m might be the, the last one. So I think this is Q2. So let's see what, what happens when you multiply by 33. So 3, 4, 6, 7 minus W should equal 33 times 104 plus W plus R2. So what is this? Um, 33 times 104, you could probably do it in your head, but let's write it down. This is 3432 uh, plus 33W. And so what's left over? Um, 346735? Is that right? 35? I need to add an extra 35 to get the 3432 up to a 3467. And I have a 33W. I want a negative W. So I guess I want minus 34W. If I have a minus 34W plus 33W will kill, will give me that negative W. And this might be it. Let me guess that this is it. Let's compute the norm of R2. The norm of R2, we might get lucky. So this is 35 squared minus 35 times negative 34, so plus 35 times 34, and then plus 34 squared, bingo. So this is 35 squared plus 34 times 35 plus 34 squared is 3571, and that is the, the, the prime that we were looking for. So x is equal to 35, and y is equal to negative 34. In, in how many divisions? Like two or three divisions. Two or three uh, steps in the GCD. All right, maybe I did that a little too quickly for some of you, so please go nice and slow, review the video, uh, review the lecture notes. But that is uh, basically everything we've covered since the previous midterm.